Hi, folks. Welcome to today's webinar. We'll just give it a few more seconds or another minute or so to let uh, more people join before we get started. Thanks for joining us. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. This is uh, part of our series of Linux Foundation networking webinars. Uh, today's discussion is on integrating ONAP with a 5G cloud native network. Our speakers today include community experts Hanan Garcia with Red Hat, Amar Kapadia with Arna Networks, and Sri Ram Rupanaguta with Arna Networks. Okay, and now we're gonna go over what our agenda looks like for today. Um, we're going to start with an introduction to cloud native 5G in the original KubeCon demo from last November, an overview of cloud native 5G and ONAP, what the demo setup looks like, and then we'll go through the actual demo and discuss what's next and open it up to Q&A. Before I hand it off to our speakers, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available starting tomorrow um, on demand. Anyone who's registered for today's demo or today's webinar will receive an email with a link to the on-demand version. Um, also, we encourage you to ask questions. Um, there's a Q&A tab. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, feel free to type it in. Um, our panelists will be answering some of those questions as they arise, but otherwise we have time at the end allotted for open Q&A as well. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Hanan, who's gonna kick us off today. Thank you very much, Jill, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really happy to be uh, talking about the work we have been doing uh, around the 5G cloud native demo, especially after KubeCon and what we are planning for the future. So maybe let's get it started. Um, as most of you probably are aware of, 5G is uh, bringing incredible capabilities to mobile networks. Ultra reliable, uh, low latency for critical applications up to one millisecond. Uh, that definitely will improve the experience for autonomous vehicle and augmented reality. Uh, there is enhanced mobile broadband that uh, 5G definitely would uh, change how much bandwidth a single customer, a single user can uh, can have. Uh, we all have seen uh, some results uh, within the gigabit range and uh, even more uh, multiple gigabit range. For, uh, for that bandwidth. Um, then there is as well the IoT support with the massive machine type communication. 5G will support up to 1 million uh, devices per square kilometer. This is actually 100 more times than what uh, 4G is providing today. But 5G, beyond that, 5G is, is a reality. As November last year, uh, during the, the presentation at KubeCamp, uh, we had around uh, 50 commercial networks in 27 countries. Uh, today, as from this month, there is already seven, 76 commercial deployments in 43 countries. This is just uh, the beginning of the 5G rollout. And I think, and um, many of us have already seen that uh, the current situation with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic would just uh, be an acceleration factor for this adoption. Uh, regarding the business opportunity, this is still ahead of us. Uh, it's estimated that more than $600 billion by 2026. Uh, it represents a large opportunity for everybody in the industry, and it, inclusive for uh, B2B, um, with private 5G and industrial 5G deployment that we will start seeing uh, that will be leading that category. One of the testimonials of the adoption of 5G uh, is uh, it was the presence of Fu, uh, Fu Kiao from China Mobile. Uh, she took this stage together with Heather Kirsley, uh, Kirsley and uh, from the Linux Foundation, uh, Sar Sajid from Red Hat. Um, and uh, she was presenting the vision of China Mobile for 5G. 
Uh, during that presentation, Fukiao described the role of open source software along with uh, some key architectural, architectural elements uh, that she present. Uh, one of those was the evolution of the NFE infrastructure toward cloud native infrastructure. This is something that is crucial for the evolution of the network. And uh, as well, the relevance of the orchestration of services across that infrastructure, as you can see on the slide, uh, they are expecting uh, many, many sites to be deployed. And uh, in this case, they were mentioning about the using ONAP as the orchestration for, uh, for those services across the infrastructure. One of the learning, um, is you go back, one of the learning that, that I, I myself retain uh, for, uh, from Fukiao is, is that 5G is, just, is much more than just a, a new generation of network. It's, it represents an opportunity for telecommunication service providers to modernize the network infrastructure. And regarding the question, uh, why do we need cloud native for 5G? There are many reasons for that. Um, as you build out an infrastructure for deploying 5G component, either the radio or the core, uh, you will want to use the same infrastructure to deploy it as well edge applications. Basically, uh, you need a common infrastructure for application and network functions. Once you do that, you can centrally manage the life cycle of those applications as uh, you can imagine a 5G network functions uh, to be just another application. Uh, so one single operational mode for 5G services. Cloud Native um, provide as well some capabilities by its own nature. Uh, high resiliency, flexibility, scalability, uh, are characteristics that are already present and native to, uh, to those environments. You can move workloads around, uh, you can create multiple instances of those workloads based on demand. That is actually what you really would like to have uh, on your next generation network. Bottom down, uh, cloud native provides a lot of benefits that 5G will require to meet network demand and to avoid infrastructure inefficiencies that, that we have seen in the past. I would like to take just a minute, a couple of minutes now to show, to, to show you and describe you what we did uh, at Kitcom last year. Um, as you remember, uh, we were presenting the proof of concept of a 5G, uh, cloud native 5G network um, live on stage. Um, one of the thing is that we didn't show just one <laughs> network, uh, a cloud native network, we actually show two networks and, and this is what basically we built. Uh, we built a full uh, cloud native 4G network in uh, Sofia Antipolis, uh, where we have the radio components and the core components all containerized. Uh, we have then in North America between Montreal and San Diego, we have a non-standalone 5G deployment, uh, meaning uh, we have a 5G radio, 4G radio connects to a, a, a 4G core. Um, and that deployment was uh, as well distributed between Montreal, where the, actually the core of the network was built, and the radio access that was uh, brought to San Diego. That's what you actually show, I, I can see on the video, uh, that was uh, next to, uh, to Heather and Azar during the presentation. Um, we ha have used as well the public cloud, to, as a resource to deploy network functions as well. Everything, all the network functions were containerized uh, across all the, all the environments, whatever it was in Sofia Antipolis, in Montreal, San Diego, on the public cloud. And especially on the public cloud, we have the IMS uh, network function and some capabilities for monitoring and uh, uh, yeah, ma mainly for monitoring as well. So we have actually two software stacks one for the premises and one for the public cloud. Um, and uh, what you can see here as well on the picture is actually the call flow that was uh, executed from, uh, from San Diego to Sofia Antipolis. And, uh, and you, as I described already, so the, on Sofia Antipolis, the, the user was connected to the IMS uh, network uh, on one side um, in, in the public cloud. And then on the other side from San Diego, uh, the other uh, leg was co uh, was connected as well to the IMS to be able to establish the call end to end. Uh, all the cloud were connected, uh, all the premises uh, were connected to the public cloud using a containerized uh, SD-1 uh, function as well. 
That's is high level uh, what was uh, uh, presented at KubeCon. And uh, I think uh, it, it was time as well that we start looking at what the evolution of this would be. And uh, that is, uh, is part of the today webinar. All right, um, Hanan, that was great. I have a question for you. Yes, Amar. So this was really, as far as I can tell, the first cloud native 5G network demo. And I want to kind of get a sense for what did the final demo experience look like? How was the excitement on the KubeCon floor? So can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. I think we have a, a very great reaction uh, during, the, during the demo. Of course, it's something that took time uh, to build. But uh, the reaction was, was just a phenomenal to be able to present for the first time uh, a cloud native uh, model for 5G and 4G networks. As I mentioned, everything was containerized uh, except for the radio and the Faraday case that we were using, of course. But all the components were, 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 were built to be executed in a cloud native environment. Okay. Hi. Oh, I have a question. Um, so, how long did you guys take to create this whole demo? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it took it took us a few months. Uh, I will say around four months to build the uh, uh, the demo. Uh, it, it was quite complex because we have teams all over the world. Uh, we have teams in, of course, in Sofia Antipolis, in Montreal, uh, in, in San Diego, in Raleigh, in China, in India. Uh, there was around 80 to 100 people at big time working on this demo uh, and our, I think it was 14 more plus organizations working on this but yeah it took us uh, a good four months to build the uh, the complete set uh, across the, the board. Great thanks. Wow that's actually quite impressive. So I have one other question how has the interest level been after KubeCon? Uh, that's a good question, uh, and, and that just to the immediate moments after the the KubeCon was already incredible. Uh, the number of of, uh, of demand that we have around this, uh, I have myself been uh, giving this uh, presentation to many service providers across the globe, uh, with only other members as well of, of Red Hat and the community. The uh, the number of questions and the number of, uh, what we did. Uh, on how we did it are uh, there. I think uh, uh, just the adoption of this was, was phenomenal. And uh, we are looking and everybody's actually asking the question is, what is next? Okay, thanks. And, and regarding that question, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you uh, the turn, Amar, uh, to give us an overview uh, of what is, uh, what is on app and, and what is coming. Okay, thanks, Hanan. So I will be talking about um, a little bit about the introduction of ONAP in the current demo. So uh, I see actually a question from Subranshu on which uh, demo orchestration or orchestration platform was used in the demo. So actually there was no orchestration platform in the original demo. So the demo that uh, Hanan just talked about for KubeCon, it was deployed manually. Now, as you saw, Hanan explained, everything except the radio in 5G is going to be software. So it's going to be entirely software driven. And when you start talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of radio sites, you start talking about uh, things like network slicing in the 5G core, extremely dynamic nature of the network, you need automation. There is no way a human being can or a set of human beings can manually manage this network. So for this reason, we decided to bring in the automation component in this 5G cloud network demo, cloud native demo. And that was done by the introduction of a open source project called ONAP. ONAP stands for Open Network Automation Platform. It is part of the Linux Foundation networking umbrella and um, I'll give you a little bit more background in the next slide. So 
So as per the website, ONAP is a comprehensive platform for orchestration. That's when you initially distribute all the software bits to the right places, configure them for day zero. Management, this is ongoing lifecycle management steps like upgrade, change management, healing, termination, and automation. Automation is where you're monitoring all the events, alarms, metrics coming from uh, your applications and the infrastructure. And based on that data, you take action. Either it's a lifecycle management action or some other action, and that's called uh, control loop automation. So of network and edge computing services for network operators, cloud providers, and enterprises. So as you see, it's designed for not just for network operators, but also for cloud providers and enterprises. Real-time policy-driven orchestration and automation of physical and virtual network functions. So when we say virtual network functions, we imply cloud-native containerized network functions also. Enables rapid automation of new services and complete lifecycle management critical for 5G and next generation networks. So that's ONAP in a nutshell. ONAP has tremendous momentum. Uh, the contributors, the end user contributors on ONAP represent over 70% of worldwide mobile subscribers. So it was kicked off really by AT&T, China Mobile and others. But since then you can see Bell Canada, Orange, Geo, Deutsche Telekom, Swisscom, Vodafone, Verizon, uh, KDDI, Turk Telecom, uh, China Telecom, Telstra, and Telecom Italia have also joined as contributors. Another key point about ONAP is it is highly aligned with open uh, standards development organizations. So for Etsy, Etsy, as everybody knows, is a pioneer in NFP. So ONAP is very strongly aligned with that. 3GPP on all the 5G efforts, TM Forum on northbound APIs, ORAN Alliance in terms of being able to manage uh, the virtual, virtual RAN, and Open Rodem in terms of optical networking. So what is ONAP? So this diagram shows a modified Etsy Diagrams. Etsy created a reference architecture diagram for NFE, and this has been modified slightly to accommodate some additional functionality that ONAP has. On the left hand side, you see the data path. The data path consists of commodity, server, storage, and switches. The whole aim of this new software driven world is to not have specialized hardware and just use standard. Uh, commodity hardware and build networks the way the big cloud providers are building their data centers. On top of that, that you have virtualization software for compute, you have containers and virtual machines. For storage, you have virtual storage. Networking, you have overlay networking. And then we also have data plane acceleration technologies such as DPTK, SRIOV, et cetera. So that makes the virtualization software. And on top of that, you have the workloads. So you have network functions, you have analytics applications and edge computing applications like AR, VR, et cetera. So that makes up your data path and the data path works on either Kubernetes or OpenStack. It could run on other technologies, but I think these two seem to be sort of um, taking the lion's share of what's called the NFV infrastructure. So that's um, uh, the data path layer and the associated uh, cloud uh, orchestration layer. Above that, you have service orchestrator or the NFV orchestrator, which in turn talks to application managers such as the VNF manager. Um, then you have SDN controller, that's a key component and finally, you have the service assurance or what's on the right-hand side called monitoring and control loop automation. ONAP uh, is, consists of what you see inside the red line, dotted line. So it consists of a service orchestrator that can take care of global orchestration. It has application managers of, the, there's a variety of controllers that ONAP has. In fact, it has four. 
It has an SDN controller <coughs> integrated for global SDN. The data center or virtual networking is still um, relegated to a component outside of ONAP. So it ONAP takes care of global and another component takes care of the data center SDN. And finally, there's a very strong service assurance component, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side. That's what ONAP is. And in terms of the interfaces on the northbound side, ONAP interfaces with OSS BSS. It interfaces with e-services. E-services are nothing but portals created for end users to order services and big data analytics, which could be data lake type applications or it could be for training AI ML engines. On the southbound side, you have the, the NFEI and the VIM layer, which is Kubernetes or OpenStack. You can have SDN controllers uh, on the southbound. And on the side, you have the workloads. So onboarding of network functions um, and then orchestrating them. So this is a very quick overview of how ONAP fits in with other components. And in the next slide, we'll look at ONAP in a little bit more detail. This is a very high level diagram of ONAP. ONAP consists of two broad components. One is design time and one, the other is runtime. And the reason this was done is we want design time people to be independent of runtime. We don't want to create any dependencies so they can do their work on their own and then runtime people can do their work on their own. Now we are not trying to create silos, of course. We want, there are multiple ways for these two sets of people to collaborate, but we just want to delineate the work so that they can make progress without you know, waiting for each other. On the design side, there is something called service design and creation. It's a unified design studio. In that you can onboard network functions and applications, you can create services, you can create policies, you can create uh, control loops, and you can, uh, there's DCA stands for data collection analytics and events. You can onboard microservices and you can design uh, control loops in, in collaboration with the DCA design studio. So there's a very rich set of design activities you can do. Also, ONAP has gone, I would say, out of its way to make the design process easy so that you don't have to be a developer um, with like a computer science degree to be able to do the design work. On the runtime side, the main component um, is service orchestrator. And like I mentioned, the service orchestrator has multiple controllers. It can call underneath. So the network controller is one application controller and there are other controllers as well. We are not showing all of them. And on the right hand side, you see active and available uh, inventory project and that's used for inventory services. So through that, you have a single source of truth. All network services, applications underneath are tracked and it's a graph database. So you can track relationships. Then you have a policy engine that's used for decision making. And last but not the least, data collection, analytics, and events. All alarms, metrics, events, um, logs, whatever data you have from a collection point of view from the applications or from the infrastructure goes to DCAE. And DCAE runs it through an analytics pipeline. The output of that goes to the policy engine. And then the policy engine drives either the service orchestrator or one of the controllers to take action. And that's what forms the control loop. So you can make corrective actions without involving human beings. Northbound side, we already discussed that. You see services, OSS, BSS, and big data. And on the southbound side also, we discussed that you see cloud infrastructure or the OpenStack Kubernetes layer third-party controllers, uh, which can include SDN controllers. And I, I failed to mention one important point. The ONAP service orchestrator can also talk to external controllers or 
virtual network function managers, element management systems, etc. So this was a super quick 10,000 or 100,000 foot view of ONAP. Um, of course, there's a lot more we could cover at a later point. So I'm going to touch upon one last point on ONAP. ONAP, the, in the community, there's a concept of use case blueprints. So of course, ONAP can support any use case from an automation point of view. But to highlight a few specific use cases, the community has created these blueprints. And the blueprints help other people see how to use ONAP. And it also provides direction to the contributors of ONAP to prioritize their work according to these sort of blueprints. Uh, there's a 5G blueprint. It's very strong in ONAP. Residential, there are a couple of residential connectivity blueprints. Cross-layer, cross-domain cross VPN for flat optical network as a service. Optical networking for transport use cases. Third-party domain controller to use ONAP sort of as an LSO, lifecycle service orchestrator, with third-party domain controllers underneath and voice over LTE. So with that, uh, I'm going to conclude my section and uh, we can proceed to the actual, what the demo looks like. So, uh, so Amar, uh, can you maybe elaborate a little bit about the kind of support that ONAP has for 5G in particular? Yes, like I said, ONAP is extremely strong on 5G. And I would say there are probably six broad components where there is activity going on. And I'm just going to highlight them real quick. So end-to-end -end orchestration of a 5G network service, including the radio area network, 5G core, and the transport that's supported. End-to-end -end network slicing. In the upcoming Frankfurt release, there's support for the CSMF and NSMF uh, GUI workflows. There is work going on in terms of harmonization with ORAN, the Open RAN Alliance for RAN support. There's support for optimizing networks based on performance management and fault management data. There's also some self-organizing networks or SON support for assigning cell IDs. And finally, there's support for PNFs, big grid radios. And other than this uh, community POC, there's also a new one that's come up in the Akraino community, Linux Foundation Edge Akraino, which is around private LTE and 5G. So I encourage everyone to sort of check that out. Um, Amar, I have a question too. How is ONAP doing with regard to cloud native support? So ONAP is actually doing quite well. There's a project in ONAP called MultiCloud. And inside the MultiCloud, there's a Kubernetes plugin. And the first Kubernetes plugin, uh, instance of the Kubernetes plugin was out about a year ago. So since then, it's matured a lot. There's, uh, in fact, we are going to see some of that. So I would say through that project, there's good support for Kubernetes. And I have, excuse me, <laughs> Amar, I have another question too. So uh, do I really need ODAP when I have uh, Kubernetes for container orchestration? That's actually a really good question, Hanan. And I, I, that comes up, a um, lot of people ask that question. So the short answer is yes. And the reason for that is Kubernetes is very uh, effective when you have an application that consists of a set of containers that you want to deploy in one site or one cluster. But if you have 10, if not hundreds of thousands of edge sites, and you have composite applications that are spanning these sites, and you need to have intent-based orchestration, complex lifecycle management, which may involve migration, replication across data centers or edge sites, and this, a uh, hugely important concept of closed control loops, then you really do need another layer on top of Kubernetes, which, uh, which is ONAP. Thank you, Amar. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Sriram. Sriram is going to talk about the demo setup and then actually show the demo.
All right, thank you. Thank you, Amar. All right, so, um, so we'll just talk about, um, you know, what, what we're going to show today in the ONAP uh, plus uh, 5G cloud native uh, demo. So the focus of this demo is really the automation, right? So, uh, so the additions from the, the demo that uh, Hanun talked about at the KubeCon, so the, the, the two additions, one is, uh, so essentially we've added ONAP as, uh, as part of the demo. And uh, it's uh, it's uh, hosted on the UNH uh, servers, right? So that's the that's the difference uh, from uh, from the KubeCon demo. And the, the focus obviously is as Amma talked about um, automation uh, using one app. Okay. And uh, we've also done some simplifications for for this demo. Uh, so we have just reduced it to one NFPI location. And uh, also reduced it to uh, just 5G core. So essentially, we replaced the uh, 5G RAM with uh, with an emulator, um, and that's what we're going to show in the in the demo. Um, and the goal of the demo is to show the onboarding uh, with uh, uh, with Ultron 5G core. That's what we've used, and uh, uh, demonstrate the deployment of the 5G core on the OpenShift. So that's that's essentially what uh, what what we're planning to show. And uh, the next phase, uh, which is kind of a post demo, uh, is we want to continue this uh, by integrating the 5G uh, network slicing. All right, so that's kind of a high level view of the demo network. Um, so on the left hand side is the 5G uh, network service uh, where it gets deployed. And on the right hand side is a control plane, that's where the own app um, runs. And uh, as I mentioned, we're running it on the UNH uh, IOL lab. Yeah, so this is kind of a more detailed view of the, uh, of the demo. So uh, on the left-hand side, what you see is uh, the own app, which is running uh, again, as I mentioned, on the UNH IOL. Uh, and it's running uh, uh, on the open source Kubernetes and that's the NFVI software. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's running on a standard um, uh, Intel servers. And on the right hand side uh, is, the, uh, is, is where uh, we're running the uh, Red Hat OpenShift. And that's where the uh, 5G core um, CNFs, the container network functions get uh, deployed. And as you can see, the 5G core, uh, we're using Altron 5G core. Um, and uh, there's divan from Turnium and uh, uh, Atens uh, uh, and GMW. So essentially, they get deployed on the Red Hat uh, OpenShift. Yeah, so this is a little more details about the demo. Um, so what we're going to show is uh, we'll show the Ultron 5G core uh, CNFs onboarded onto an app. Uh, using the uh, uh, the SDC function, which is service design and creation. Uh, it's one of the projects in uh, ONAP. Um, so for the purpose of this demo, uh, we are actually pre-installing ONAP because uh, obviously that's a, uh, that's a different process altogether. Um, and the 5G network, uh, uh, 5G core network service is created um, in ONAP using SDC. And, uh, and the next step is it's deployed on the OpenShift by using the ONAP uh, Kubernetes adapter. Uh, if you remember uh, one of the slides where Amar showed uh, uh, the multi-cloud and uh, various adapters. So uh, the Kubernetes uh, plugin is one of the adapters um, to talk to um, the, the Kubernetes uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, in this demo, we're going to use the APIs for, uh, for the runtime operations. So the design will be shown with the GUI, the SDC GUI. Uh, but the deployment will be using the uh, APIs. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the previous slide, um, instead of using the RAN, uh, we're going to use a GNB emulator uh, from Ultron. Um, so that emulates both the uh, user equipment as well as the RAN. And uh, also uh, just a note is that uh, in, the, in the today's demo, uh, we're going to run entirely in the uh, UNH IOM on a single server. Uh, that's uh, 
uh, even the OpenShift, we are running on the same server uh, as, as two different uh, clusters. So that's the, uh, that's the demo that we're going to show. Uh, so essentially two clusters on a single server, one running one app, the other one is OpenShift, where we will deploy uh, Ultron 5G core CNFs. And, and then we'll run the uh, GNB emulator to show the, um, the, the, the connectivity. So that's the, that's the demo that we're going to show. All right, so now we uh, jump to the actual uh, demo. All right, so this is the server where we are running the demo, uh, the single server where all of them uh, are running. So you can see A1 and A2 are the instances where ONAP is running. And uh, the CRC uh, is the VM where OpenShift is, uh, is, is running. Okay, so we deployed, for the purpose of this demo, we deployed a subset of ONAP, not the full uh, uh, functionality. So the first step is to uh, register the OpenShift cluster with, uh, with ONAP Kubernetes uh, um, uh, plugin. Uh, so that's what we're going to do with uh, using the uh, using the REST APIs. So you can see the curl command um, with which registers the OpenShift cluster. And then we go to the ONAP portal. Uh, those of you familiar with ONAP, uh, this should be uh, familiar. So we log in as a designer. So as Amor mentioned, uh, in case you're not familiar with ONAP, uh, there is a design phase and there is, there is a runtime. So this, what we're doing right now is the, is the design phase of ONAP, where we're going to be designing in the CNMs. So then we start the SDC um, GUI in, uh, in, in the portal. So the first step is to onboard um, the VSP, what's called as a VSP. So in this case, it's, it's actually a container um, function. So we're going to call it uh, Ultron uh, NGC, next generation core. So this is the standard onboarding uh, process uh, in, uh, in, in SDC which is common to both uh, uh, virtual network functions as well as the container functions. So in this case, we are going to show it um, for the container functions. All right, so now we're going to take the, uh, the package and, uh, and input that. So that's the zip file uh, that, that has the package and we, I'll, I'll talk about what, what it contains. So here I'm going to show you the, the contents of the, the, the zip file. So that's the package which we are uh, onboarding. And uh, so it, it contains the, the Helm charts for the container, the container network functions. So it consists of the values.yaml, uh, the chart.yaml, uh, and, uh, um, and the templates, which contains the details about uh, all the CNFs that we are uh, onboarding. So that's the package that we have just uh, onboarded in, in the previous step in, uh, in SDC. Right, so now we'll go back to the SDC. So now we proceed to the validation where SDC will ensure that the package is, uh, is, has the right contents. And then we commit and submit it. So 
so submit uh, succeeded. The next step is to uh, import that, which essentially creates a, uh, a model for it. Yeah, you can see the Ultron NGC, and we're going to import that. So we are still in the design phase of, uh, of ONAP. So this is all the SDC. So here we certify that. So the next step is to create a service, network service. So we're going to call it Ultron NGC service. And we input a description. And now we're going to include uh, the, the CNF uh, model. Uh, uh, CNF model that we've just created in the previous step. So this is a drag and drop operation where you can drag it into the to the palette, and uh, um, and that's how you create a uh, network service. So now this network service that we're going to create has uh, the, the the CNF that we just onboarded. Right. So now we've distributed. So the process of distribution is essentially distributing to the other modules of ONAP. So now the distribution is done. Uh, so now the runtime knows about this, uh, this network service. So now we're back to the, uh, the runtime where we can start uh, uh, instantiating it. So you can see that right now there are no containers running. Uh, so the first step is to uh, uh, create a profile in the resource bundle. So the, the profile is like, a, like an instance of, of this uh, model that we just created. So like I mentioned, uh, so this part is, is all using uh, uh, REST APIs. So we are directly talking to the, uh, the Kubernetes uh, plugin. So this step is to do the uh, creating the instance. So this is this is the final step where um, the uh, the CNF actually gets deployed on on the cloud that we've registered, which uh, in this case is OpenShift. So now we've run the uh, create instance. So with this, we should see the containers uh, coming up on the uh, on the OpenShift. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's, it's done. So now we can see through the uh, OpenShift uh, command line interface, uh, the, the parts. So you can see that uh, there are a whole bunch of these uh, NGC parts uh, that are in the creating uh, state. The OC command is uh, basically the OpenShift uh, command line interface for running the Kubernetes commands. So it takes a little bit of time for the containers to go to running state. Yeah, so now you see all of the containers uh, running. So now the 5G core is running on OpenShift. So now what we're going to do is uh, run the uh, GNB simulator. Uh, since we don't have the real uh, RAN um, uh, uh, CNFs here, so we're going to run it, uh, test it with, uh, with the simulator. So for this, we use Altran's uh, GNB simulator. So we are running that simulator now. Yeah, so you can see that now the simulator is uh, uh, talking to 5G core CNFs and it runs uh, some tests. Um, Mm 
which essentially shows that uh, the, the containers are uh, the 5G core containers are healthy. All right, so you can see that the, the tests have passed. So essentially, the the simulator uh, makes sure that the containers, the, the 5G core containers are all running and they're in healthy state. So that's the that's the end of the demo. So essentially, we show it uh, using the emulator instead of the uh, with a real uh, user equipment and uh, and, and a RAN network. All right, so that brings us to the end of the demo. Okay, wonderful. In we have a lot of questions. So in interest of time, I'm going to speed things up uh, so we can get to the questions. So I would like to thank all the contributors for this demo. A10, Arna Networks, Altran, Intel, Kalum, Lenovo, Red Hat, Ternium, and the UNH IOL Lab. So let's talk a little bit about what's next. We are going to show the next installment of this work at ONES, which is scheduled in September. Um, so one very important thing to note is that these Activities are not static. They're not a one-time effort, they're continuous. So the next installment, we hope to show some network slicing and that's what uh, uh, will be the phase, next phase. And you can learn about it, the event at this link. Um, how to get involved? Like I mentioned, these are not static activities, so please get involved. You can join this, the phase two of the demo around which will be around network slicing. You can see the link. Uh, you can get involved with ONAP, other LFN uh, projects, CNTT, which is working on, CNTT RA2 is working on uh, the NFVI from a containerized point of view. OVP is a compliance and verification program. There's also work going on between CNCF and the LFN community in terms of uh, telco requirements at this next link. And you can learn more about the original demo that Hanan talked about at the last link. With that, we can uh, address some questions. Great, um, as you said, uh, Amar, there's, uh, there's a handful of questions here. So we're just gonna go down the list. Um, so our first question is 5GC, MME, HS, HSS, et cetera. Are they open source components? This particular demo does not use open source 5G core. It's using um, a containerized 5G core from a company called Altran. However, there are others which we are keeping an eye on. TIP OCN is creating an open source 5G. And of course, there are other efforts as well. And just to add to that, Amar, uh, we, we have the working with the Open Air uh, Interface Software Alliance that is open source. Wow. And they have actually built the, the 4G uh, core uh, for the KubeCam demo. Correct, correct. And they are also working towards 5G, I believe. Correct. Great. Uh, so the next question, can we move with public cloud on edge? So I think uh, maybe a more accurate way to say that is, can we move with public cloud technologies at the edge? Because the edge, the real estate is controlled by telecom operators, cable companies, and enterprises. And in some cases, smart cities, it may be owned by the city. So it's not so much that you can bring the public cloud to the edge, but you can bring public cloud technologies. So all of the big three, Amazon has something called Outpost, Google has something called uh, Anthos and Microsoft, I apologize, I forget the latest term, but it's uh, based on their art technology. So all of them have edge technologies that can be used. Great. Um, our next question is about the demo. Uh, did you face any latency challenges? Shriram, you wanna take that? Um. 
So what, what we showed is just the, um, the control path, onboarding the 5G core, and, uh, um, and, and really running a emulator. So we had, uh, actually we did not uh, uh, see any of the latencies in that, uh, in, in that part of the uh, demo. Okay, next question. Other than AT&T, who is running ONAP in production? In fact, uh, there's a new piece that's going to come out that's going to talk about Bell Canada's use of ONAP in production. And um, at the POC or pre-production level, there are just numerous uh, telco operators that are working on different, different use cases. And we don't have time to cover all of that, but but sufficient to say that there's probably half a dozen who are in the just one step before production. Great. Um, next question. How does ONAP compare and or coexist with MANO? So ONAP does, is in the MANO category. It just happens to have functionality that is over and above that of MANO. So all of the MANO functionality in terms of NFV orchestrator, the VNF manager functionality is already in ONAP. Great, thank you. Um, is Istio required with ONAP to manage with Kubernetes? Which ONAP release and version is, and the second question to that is which ONAP release and version is used in the demo? So in this uh, demo, uh, we've actually used uh, the, the latest one, uh, the master, which is essentially uh, Frankfurt. So even though it's Frankfurt is not officially out, um, so it's actually um, very close to uh, the Frankfurt. So that's what we've used in this uh, demo. And in terms of Istio, Istio is not required, but uh, both, there is a strong move in ONAP to move towards Istio from multiple points of view. So from a Kubernetes plugin, Istio can be in the NFVI on which CNFs and other workloads will be deployed. And in fact, ONAP's installation and lifecycle management project OOM is also moving in the direction of Istio. And I think someone just clarified the Microsoft technology is called Azure Carrier Edge Zones. So thank you, Raja, for that. Okay, um, another question. You mentioned ONAP is used for multi-cluster orchestration. How is the right cluster selected during deployment time? So there's a notion of intent. So when you deploy a composite application, the Kubernetes plugin has a number of concepts such as profile, which dis determines day zero configuration and intent, which determines where the composite application gets deployed. Um, okay, somebody's asking when we can get the recording, that's gonna be available tomorrow. Um, is it possible to the NGC package in order to test it with Kubernetes plugin? Um, we can, uh, the, the demo, of course, is open. How the demo is constructed, all of that know-how is available. The next generation core or the 5G core is from Altron, so that you would um, essentially have to get an evaluation license for that one component. And if you contact any of the three panelists, we can help you with that. Great, thank you. Um... What are the minimum hardware requirements for ONAP installation? Um, yeah, so it depends on you know which components of ONAP uh, that you that you require. For this demo, we've actually uh, deployed only a subset that's required to orchestrate the CNFs. Uh, but for the full ONAP deployment, um, it's it's actually well documented in terms of the requirements. Um, so the non-HA for development. Um, can be deployed in uh, uh, probably as um, few as uh, maybe 64 virtual CPUs and you know close to 128 GB RAM. So that's 
typically what we use internally for our development. And, and of course, the HA deployments will require more uh, resources and, and also more number of servers. Uh, but the very basic minimum for testing and for development can be done on a single, uh, you know, a fairly powerful server. And if it's a minimum subset, it can even be even in a smaller server. Okay, and second question um, on that one is, is it possible to simulate end-to-end -end 5G network slicing and orchestration by using ONAP, by using the current ONAP version, or should we wait for the next version? This so may the, sort of been answered already, Amar, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we have to wait for Frankfurt. Frankfurt has that support, which is coming out just, uh, it's around the corner. Okay, a um, few more questions. Now we have hardware acceleration from Mellanox and Xilinx. Um, how, FPGA -based ex how is FPGA-based acceleration supported? Hanan, do you want to talk about the acceleration in the original demo? Yeah, we, we actually, yeah, we, we were, uh, we use actually acceleration uh, for the radio set up, for the radio part, uh, the hardware that was in, in uh, San Diego. Um, and uh, to be able to actually uh, for the radio access network to perform. So we use, uh, yeah, we use FPGA cards um, and SRUV as well uh, on, the, uh, on the EPC side. So those technologies are available um, for acceleration. Okay, great. Um, so we had a question about how this will integrate with Open Horizon, which is a new project um, on with LF Edge. We may have to take a rain check on that one. I don't know if any of the panelists are familiar with Open Horizon. Yep, that's fair. Okay, is CNF using Helm 3? Yes, it is. Okay, um, can you put shed some light on CUPS support? Yes, so CUPS support is essentially a data path uh, discussion. So control plane, user plane separation. Um, it, it, so this, it doesn't really affect the latest demo, but uh, having said that, on the 5G core side, of course, the UPF is separated from all the other control path 5G core functions. Okay, how was geo redundancy achieved in cloud native deployment shown here? What were the use cases that were tested and were data path accelerators also used like DPDK, VPP, et cetera? So I think that's a multi-part question. I think the first part was geo redundancy, right? Yes. So geo redundancy can be accomplished from two points of view. One is to have um, containerized application with uh, replicated pods. So if the pods are replicated across, uh, you have a, uh, enough replication. If let's say you have a replication factor of three, you get availability within the cluster. And then the second technique is to replicate across uh, geographies. So this particular demo as uh, Sridhar mentioned is um, in one site, but uh, for the next phase, we are, those are exactly the, the types of things we are looking at. And, and uh, if you would like, please do get involved. Uh, we are looking for sort of always looking for expertise in these types of things. Um, yeah, that actually leads to another question. Someone's asking about how to join ONAP. So joining ONAP, uh, all you really need is a Linux Foundation ID. You can get it at identity.linuxfoundation.org. Um, it's a two minute process. And once you have that, you can um, join, you can get onto the wiki, you can start participating, you can join meetings, you can start contributing. Uh, of course, you can become a Linux Foundation member that affords you additional advantages, but it's not necessary. You can literally get going in two minutes.
Okay, great. Um, so I know we ha still have a handful of questions, but we are actually at time. Um, so we will try to get to those questions um, via email. If, if folks um, do have questions, you can just email um, PR at LFN at Linux Foundation Networking dot org and uh, we will answer those questions. So I want to thank all of our panelists today and thank you for everyone who participated and stay tuned uh, for our next LFN webinar and uh, a recording of this session will be available tomorrow. Have a great day. <laughs>